All right, if you will, turn to chapter 5 of the book of Romans. I want to deal this morning with a, another aspect of what we're studying in our studies in Romans, justification by faith, chapters 4 and 5. We have set forth here a very profound truth, very profound doctrine, has to do with what is known in theology as original sin. So we're going to be dealing this morning with the question of original sin. There are only two views, those who believe that all men are under condemnation when they're born in this world, and the Arminian view. <laughs> There's always the biblical view, and then the Arminian view. And the Arminian view is that God condemns us because we sin, and for that alone, whereas the scriptures show, and we intend to show from this passage and other verses this morning, that we're born under the sentence of death. And proof of that is that all die, whether 90 seconds old, 90 years old. So there must be an explanation for that. We either have to stay with the word or with man's theology and his pride. So this is a very profound question that divides theologians and Christians and churches and denominations in their thinking, in theology at least, and it's very significant. And if you've done any thinking at all about something besides just, you know, Sunday school level of teaching, certainly this question must have been raised in your mind, why is it that all die? How can I be charged with Adam's condemnation? And again, like many other teachings, whether it be election or predestination or the nature of man or whatever, we'll have to stay with the word if we're going to call ourselves Christians. And it's pretty plain here that we all die, and we all die because Adam sinned. So what we have to do is to find out our relationship to the first Adam and the consequences of being related to him and to the second Adam, our last Adam, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, we begin with verse 12, we've already covered verses 1 to 11. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. That is, death came because of that sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to the law, to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Death reigned even before there was a law to transgress. Death reigned even though no man can sin Adam's sin. See, only he could transgress the commandment not to eat of the fruit. And yet, death reigns. So what's the explanation? It's not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was through one to condemnation. Now, it couldn't be any plainer than that that through one man, condemnation has come on the whole world. So regardless of what you believe, or you're taught in your theology or your church, that's what it says. Through the judgment of one, all became condemned. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, and he keeps repeating one, that because one sin we're all under condemnation, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Of course, those who believe in that case, as the scriptures say over and over. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now the word many there, of course, we know means the whole human race because he's already said in chapter 3 that we're all guilty, we've all sinned, there's none righteous. 
Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're going to be dealing with the doctrine of original sin. And that is a basic question in all denominational theology, where it's Catholic or Protestant, and there's no agreement even among the Protestants. But basically, what do we mean by original sin? It means that Adam, as the head of the human race, acted as our representative back there in the garden. And that the consequences and condemnation of his sin, which is the original sin, that's where they get the term, the condemnation and consequences of his sin passed upon the whole human race because the whole human race was in Adam when he sinned. And whether or not you know it, it's a fact, a medical fact, a scientific fact, you were in Adam when he sinned. Unless you believe in evolution, then you were in Adam. And as we'll show you later, Adam could not produce anything better than himself. And God, when he dealt with Adam, as we can show you from things he said to Adam, was dealing with the whole human race in Adam. Well, look at verse 12. You see, the consequences of his disobedience was death. And this death has passed to all of us. By one man sin entered into the world, and death by that sin. And so death has passed upon all men. Now you could just put a period there and make the next phrase stand by itself for all practical purposes. If you're not trying to get into Arminian arguments and so forth, then the next statement is all have sinned. Well, he's already said that in chapter 3. Of course, their argument is God condemns man because he sins, not because he's a sinner. He becomes a sinner by his environment and so forth. One man's sin entered the world. Now look at it. And death was sin, and so death is passed upon all men. Now that's what it's saying. It doesn't matter about your theology. All die. And so if that's the truth, then we have to find out why all men are dying and how we can remedy it if we can. And that, of course, has been the historical view of the church, that we were all in Adam. He was the head of the race. He's the father of us all, as the scriptures say. And when he sinned, then he alienated himself from God. The human race is alienated because the human race was in him. And therefore, the race is fallen in Adam. Now, the Arminian view is, as we've already shown you, that man is not morally and spiritually bankrupt, that he does not inherit Adam's sinful nature, but he inherits a tendency to sin, a tendency towards sin, a proneness to sin. Isn't strange all die if it's just a tendency, but we're told that God could not justly condemn the race for what one man did. And that we should read the verse, the first phrase and the last phrase is the sense of it. We're told that all men die because all sin. And of course it does say that death is passing of all men, and it does say that all have sinned. And it sounds very logical to say that's why they die, because they sin is why they die. That is, that's the only reason they die, because they sin. Sounds very logical, but logical and scriptural does not always mean the same thing. Because the phrase in verse 12 is that because of one man, death entered this world. And that death, he said, passed upon all men. And so logical and scriptural are not always the same thing or do not always have the same meaning because he's not saying there that death came because all sinned. He says death came because one man sinned. And death is passed upon all men. You could almost add a parenthetically, and all men are sinners, and all have sinned, because that's a fact, too, set forth in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. And so the Arminian claim that, and that's where most people are, if they're doing any thinking about it in this age of shallow Christianity. Even the seminary where I attended, they did not believe that we inherit the sinful nature of Adam. Baptist seminary. And it's very hard to get people, as I say today, to actually take a biblical position on these deeper truths. So it's not just academic to be studying this in this way this morning from chapter 5. But the Arminian claim, I started to say, that we do not inherit a sinful nature, 
that man is not morally and spiritually bankrupt when he's birthed into the world implies that if we could ever find a man who hadn't sinned, then he could be justified on the basis of his self-righteousness. He would be righteous in himself. He would not need Jesus. Uh, isn't there something working in your spirit when you just say that that kind of reacts to such statements? That the whole Bible rejects self-righteousness as a basis upon which God will accept us. And not to need Jesus is not even words that a thinking person, a Christian, could even utter. If we just inherit a tendency towards sin, why is it we've not found a man somewhere who hasn't sinned? Then he could be justified by his own righteousness, self-righteousness. In fact, Paul said if there's a law that would justify a man by keeping it, then justification would come by keeping the law. But he says there is no such law. There's no way because man, you know, is spiritually bankrupt to begin with. But if he only inherits a tendency towards sin or a proneness to sin when he's born, how do we explain the fact that none have ever been able to overcome the tendency? But if Romans 5.12 is true, that all have sinned and all die, then we end up the same place. What does it matter if you're just going to, for sake of argument, whether or not you're born into the world with a depraved nature, a sinful nature, as the scriptures show, if, in fact, all sin and all die? So we end up the same place. So we might as well stay with the Bible that says we're sinners by nature and choice. That's what the Bible says. Sinner by nature and sinner by choice. By choice, all right, Romans 5.12 is the choice. For all have sinned. There's a sinner by choice. He didn't say all are sinners. He said all have sinned. We'll stay with that. There's a sin by choice. Isaiah 53.6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. There's sinners by choice. But the scriptures also speak of the fact that we are sinners by nature. In Ephesians 2 and verse 3, it says that we are by nature the children of wrath. By nature. That's what you are by nature. You're not good by nature. You don't just inherit a tendency towards sin. He says that we all had our life in times past in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. And many passages teach that, like Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's the nature. He says the heart. He means the man, the person. He didn't say becomes that way because he inherits a tendency. Now, there are two unscriptural views that I'd like to mention this morning about the nature of man. One is the materialistic view, and the other is the idealistic view. And the materialistic view, which could be called the naturalistic view, is that man is simply a part of nature. There's no spiritual element at all. Death ends it all. At death, the personality ceases to exist. Materialism and naturalism is taught in the colleges. It's believed by the state and most of your scientists and medical doctors and whatever. It's a naturalistic view of man, materialistic and naturalistic view. Man is just uh, an aggregation of carbohydrates crawling toward oblivion. That's all he means. And at death, he ceases to exist. Then there is the opposite, the idealistic view, which is the Arminian view, that man is a spark of the divine, and therefore he's essentially good in his nature. That man isn't depraved, he just inherits a tendency towards sin and becomes depraved or becomes a sinner. They won't even use the word depraved. Man isn't lost. He simply strayed from the right path because of his bad environment. And so the social gospel comes along and tells us that in order to make man morally upright and to enable him to realize his potential, we need to improve his social environment, educate the masses, clean up the corruption in politics, end all economic need and want, and teach the world how to live by the Sermon on the Mount, the Golden Rule. So doing will produce the kingdom of God on earth. Well, that's the materialistic or naturalistic and the idealistic view, and then there's another view, and that's the biblical view, which is neither one of those. Biologically, the Bible shows that man is a creature made from the dust, Genesis 2-7, for God 
formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. Now, naturalism says that's all he is. He's just a creature of the dust, and he goes back to dust, and there's no spiritual element. But the Bible goes on to say in those same passages that teach us that he's a creature of the dust, that he has a spiritual element. He's not only made from the earth and earthy, but he is created in the image of God, Genesis 1:27, James chapter 3 and verse 9. So he is biologically a product of the dust, spiritually. He has a divine image breathed into him. But the picture is not complete just by saying what he is biologically and spiritually. Before the fall, we do not have the complete picture till we depict man after the fall. And as we look at the word of God from Genesis 3 on, we see what he is after the fall. We find that man is not only what God has made him, but he's what he's made himself. He's a sinner. He's not only what God has made him, but he is what he's made himself. So Romans 1, we saw he's in willful rebellion against God. Romans 2, he willfully sins against the light God gives him and rejects the light. Romans 3, that the sin and guilt and the condemnation is universal. All are guilty, God said in Romans 3. In chapter 4, we saw there's none righteous, and righteousness can only be imputed by faith to a person. We dealt with that in chapter 4. In chapter 5, we see that men are sinners by nature and choice. Proof of this is to be seen all through the Bible in the universal declaration that all men need to repent. Acts 17.30, God calls all men everywhere to repent. In the scriptural declaration that all men need to be born again, ye must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. He says that to Nicodemus, a religious person, that all men need to be justified, all men need the atonement, all men need to have faith in Christ. He that believeth on the Son hath life, he that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So over and over, the scriptures declare a universal need of repentance and atonement and regeneration and faith in God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Then as you look at your own experience, you see that history proves the fact that men are more than just sinners by choice, but they're birthed into the world as sinners because of the fact that we see on every hand the degeneracy, the crimes, the war, murders, and all sorts of wrongdoing, which can only be explained not from the liberals' viewpoint that man is getting better and better, but from the viewpoint of two world wars, a Korea, a Vietnam, Lebanon, and on and on and on, wars and rumors of wars, that man is not getting better. The fact that he needs moral training. All parents know they have to teach their children something. They have to begin to teach some moral and ethical principles. And even those who have had no teaching whatever realize they're not what they should be. We're just birthed into the world, not what we should be. It's like the mother said to Johnny, why don't you ever do something good? Why are you always naughty and into trouble? Why can't you do good once in a while? He said, because it makes me so tired. <laughs> and it's an effort to do good. You don't have to do anything to just be naturally bad. <laughs> so the scriptures point out that original sin is, in fact, a truth. Now, the interpretation of it might be one thing or another, but nevertheless, the fact that the condemnation and the judgment and the sentence pronounced upon Adam was transmitted to the whole human race because the scriptures show us that Adam was the representative head of the human race, and his fall involved the whole human race in his condemnation because his judgment, his condemnation, is imputed to all mankind. Now, that's nowhere more clearly seen than in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Now, whether or not you look it up, at least listen to it, because this proves the point beyond a shadow of a doubt. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For in Adam all die that whatever the sentence was upon Adam has been passed upon the human race, as Romans 5.12 says, is unmistakably confirmed here in the 22nd verse, in Adam all die. In Christ all are made alive. Sure, all who are in Christ, all believers, but we're not all in Christ unless we by faith are in him, but the whole human race is in Adam. In Adam all die is a fact of scripture and experience, because all die. Even the scripture didn't tell it, you'd know something's wrong. 
And so we either have to settle the question on the basis of what the Bible says or on the basis of man's theological opinion, which as often as not just runs you up some stream to minister to pride or people's feelings or something else. I mean, just some mothers don't want to be told their little children are not angels. I've actually had people bring a child to me for help, and I'd suggest they need deliverance to help. Oh, get mad at you. You saying my child has demons? <laughs> well, I said I didn't exactly say it that way, but there's a spirit oppressing that child, an evil spirit. And get mad and want to fuss and argue and probably do more than that if they could get away with it. So theological opinion sometimes just ministers to what people want to hear, pride. But friends, the word is pretty strong. That God regarded Adam not just as an individual, but as a representative of the human race. Now you go back and read Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and see if he didn't. Was he only speaking to Adam when he said, be fruitful and multiply? Well, if he had, you wouldn't be here. But the human race, his descendants, believed and believes God's talking to us as well as Adam. But he didn't say it to you, he said it to your father who represents us. We were in him when God said that. Was it only to Adam that after he sinned, he said, in the sweat of your face, you will eat your bread? Or do we all have to labor to make a living? Well, you can answer that without even hesitating. And was he only speaking to Adam when he said, out of dust you were taking, dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return? You're going to die? Was he only speaking to him or to the human race? And so by virtue of the fact that the consequences of Adam's condemnation is experienced by the whole human race must mean that God was dealing with the race in Adam. And that alone explains 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die. Why should we die because we're in him? Well, he's telling you all through the word of God why you die. In Adam, God was dealing with the race because the race was in Adam. You were in Adam. It could actually be demonstrated if we had the knowledgeable ability to do it because it's a scientific fact that you can do it. If it were possible to trace your genes back to your ancestor, and any, any medical scientist or anyone else knows that genes are transmitted, that's what transmits the characteristics of whether you have curly hair, any hair, blue eyes, brown eyes, tall, short, fat, or thin, by your genes. If they had a way to scientifically check it, you'd see that the genes in you go right back to your parents, Adam and Eve. Of course, I recognize that you could only go back so far today because evolution is tossed in most of the schools, so they won't hold to that theory. But the point is, you were in Adam. And the fact that the Bible says all men die because they were in Adam doesn't say because they sinned, because they were in Adam. Certainly they die because they're sin. We know that. So that's taught all through the Bible. <laughs> But we're getting back to the cause of why we die. Because why wouldn't there have been one man, one woman somewhere, and some were called righteous in the Bible, like Job. And some of the women that we could mention, you know, Samuel's mother, devout people, we could mention why couldn't just one of those have gotten over the tendency to sin? And so by virtue of the fact that the Bible says all are dying, then it must mean that we're not just sinners by choice, but that we're sinners by nature. God does hold us personally accountable if we sin. That's the teaching of the Word. That isn't what we're saying. But what starts the thing moving? What is the source and cause of all of this evil? And when you get into the Word of God, you see Ephesians 2, 3, by nature we're children of wrath. By nature we are. Psalm 51.5, David, God's choice, said, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Psalm 58.3, the wicked go astray as soon as they're born, speaking lies. Now, do you know any righteous born in the world? Of course not. It's just another way of saying that men are born in the world as cute little babies, baby boys and girls, going astray as soon as they're born. Because you don't know anyone who didn't go astray. And I don't know what you mean by going astray because anything that is not right is going astray. And those little angels have all sorts of methods to prove to you they're not angels. <laughs> oh, we've gone through that before, haven't we? You can just have one of your own and you'll find out quickly enough. But that doesn't mean that they are as 
newborn babes personally guilty, which brings us back to the fact that something is wrong with our natures because infants, innocent, who have never sinned, die many times, right at birth. Maybe they'll take one breath or two and have never transgressed anything. He's already said here in the chapter that sin wasn't even imputed when there was no law to transgress, but they died anyway. Why do infants die except Romans 5, 12, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 give us the explanation? For by one man sin entered the world, death by sin, and death is passed upon all men, whether they're 90 years old or 90 seconds. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die. Then if you'll note in verses 12 to 14 of Romans 5, that he makes a very profound observation here. He said in these verses that guilt for transgression of the law was not imputed because where there's no law, you can't be charged guilty of transgressing it. He said sin was in the world before there was a law. Nevertheless, he said sin was not imputed until the law came. But he said, nevertheless, death reigned from the creation of Adam till the law, Moses, who gave the law. Then he says the second thing here, not only did death reign even when no woman's transgressing God's laws, but he says death reigned even in the lives of those who didn't sin like Adam. In other words, he's the one that caused the problem. He's the guilty one. No one has ever committed Adam's sin but Adam. No one could. Well, the only explanation is we were in him when he sinned. And 1 Corinthians 15, 22 plainly tells you that in Adam all die. And so we have to stay with the word. The consequences of Adam's sin as the head of the human race is imputed to all men, inflicted upon all men, charged to all men. Whether a person likes it or not isn't going to change the fact that they're all dying. And whatever your opinion is about how you die, the result's the same. <laughs> so we may as well stay with the Bible. We're going to end up in the same grave. And that says, the Bible, none righteous. The Bible says, all of sin. The Bible says, the whole world's guilty. All this is in Romans. We're not even out of Romans telling you that. Romans says that even if sin was not charged to you, if there was no law that you could transgress, you would still die. It says that even if you can't sin the sin of Adam and become guilty and bring death into this world, death is already here. It's already passed upon you. So we might as well stay with the word. So you aren't given the choice whether or not you can be born. You're not given the choice after you're born whether or not you live or die. Because you're born under the sentence of death. Over and over it is said that we are condemned because we're in Adam. You're not given any choice about that. The only choice you're given is to believe the gospel and to break that awful chain of death that is running throughout the human race. So the scriptures will show you that all men are in Adam and because we're in Adam then what happened to him is going to happen to us. Whether people like it or not, some of them it's going to happen anyway to them. In fact, you have right here in the Word of God several places where you can see what one does can affect others. Like, for example, in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. That's not an unscriptural principle that what one does affects his descendants. Hebrews 7, verses 9 and 10. Speaking of Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek. Now that's long before Jacob and the twelve sons of Jacob, and one was Levi, was ever heard of or born. So verse 9 of chapter 7, As I may so say, Levi also, and he's not even born yet, who receives tithes, paid tithes, in Abraham. He says, Levi and the tribe of Levi, the priests, received the tithes. When that came into existence quite a few hundred years later, he said, Levi, who receives the tithes, actually paid tithes, in Abraham. Abraham paid the tithes to Melchizedek. Then he explains it. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. And so Levi paid tithes even though the genes had not even come forth yet. They were still in Abraham. And of course from Abraham all the way back to Adam. But the tribe of Levi here is credited with doing something and they're not even in existence yet. You've got Abraham who paid the tithes and you've got Isaac, his son, then you've got Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons and one of them's Levi. Then by analogy, over and over the scriptures show the condemnation and punishment of your guilt was laid on Christ. 
And if we're in him, then his payment of that debt is charged to our account as if we paid it. It's imputed to us. Just like our sin is imputed to him, his righteousness is imputed to us. Again, that is why that he can't be a sinner, because he be, have no righteousness to impute to us. If you look here at verse 15, you'll see the how that one man can affect the whole race. Verse 15, through the offense of one, many are dead. Well, you say, how can that be? The offense of one, many are dead. How can God charge me with the condemnation and punishment of Adam's sin? Well, if we just put a little thing here on the board, people wrestle with the problem all the time that we're dealing with this morning. God, who gave life to man, this is Adam before he fell, but see, the life of God, the life in man came from God before the fall. And the race is in Adam. Before the fall, if he had obeyed God, the race would have been blessed. The race is in Adam. Had he obeyed God, that life would flow through Adam to the whole human race. But when Adam sinned, it's, oh, it's so simple. It just severed the connection. And there is no way that the race can have any life because the one through whom God was giving the life physically and spiritually is alienated from God and cut off. And the only way that you'll ever get life again is to see that God came down and the cross makes a connection and this now becomes the last Adam, the last man or the last Adam. If we're in him by faith, then the life is flowing again from God to man. Just as Levi paid tithes in Abraham, so we're condemned because we were in Adam. And when Adam sinned, the connection was severed. He was alienated from the life and blessings of God, and he could know nothing now but hardship and death. Make it on his own. That isn't the whole story, of course, because God came seeking man, and he sent the last Adam to restore the connection between God and man through the cross, through the blood of the cross. But verse 15 is clear. Through the offense of one, many are dead. Then verse 16. For judgment was by one to condemnation. By one. Tell us we can't be condemned and judged for Adam's sin. Why it says right there, that's the whole basis of your being judged and condemned. For judgment was by one to condemnation. Verse 18. By the offense of one, all are condemned. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So all who are represented here by the first Adam die. And who does Adam represent? The whole human race. And all who are represented by the last Adam live. And who are represented by the last Adam? All who believe. So the only question this morning is not how you got that way, and what is the theological explanation of it, but what can I do about it? Because both from Scripture and experience, I find that all men die. They're under condemnation for some reason. Therefore, God has provided a way, and the way is the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's not always how can I explain how I got this way, but what can I do about my condition, because I sure can't change it by myself. Amen. Would you stand me, please? Amen. Lord, we pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit now upon the word to our hearts in such a way that we'll see that we are lost and undone without Jesus, that on the basis of our own righteousness we cannot be accepted, we cannot be approved, but that through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ we're able to stand this morning and declare victory and the hope of eternal life because this is the restoration that we've received in him for we have now received the reconciliation between God and man through Jesus Christ our Lord by faith. Hallelujah. In Jesus name Father we ask you to make the truth of the book of Romans 
real and alive in our hearts. That we'll not just be Christians by hope, but that we'll be Christians by knowledge of what you've done for us, that we're secure in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. We'll know that it's based upon the faithful word and promises of God. To this end we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, the question is, you have to answer this morning, all of us, is we know we're in the first Adam. The only way you could avoid that conclusion is either deny you're a member of the human race or that you're God himself, and neither one of those you could convince us of. And so the only conclusion is, since you're an Adam, you're faced with death, that in Christ you can be made alive. Amen. So, as we think about what God has done on our behalf, we need to think about what he will do on your behalf if you don't know our experience. Why don't you just settle the matter if there's someone here that needs to settle it with Jesus Christ. He says you're in Adam, you're under condemnation. Your father has sinned and God has condemned the human race. That's clearly taught in the fifth chapter of Romans because of their relationship to Adam. But the hope is that 1 Corinthians 15.22 will be your experience. That as in Adam all die, that you can be in Christ by faith and have life. For in him all live. And just Ask him to come into your heart and cleanse you of that sin and that you are now receiving him as your Lord and Savior, the Lord of your life. That you want to follow him in baptism and discipleship and faithfulness and obedience and know that peace that passes all understanding that those who are in Christ have. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God.